morning, church. So Wednesday night lesson was about finding answers in the Bible. And what I did is I, I brought my laptop into the youth room, which is the easiest way to find verses in the Bible. Use Google. Not that I'm promoting here. But um, so what I did is I asked the kids, you know, you have a question, you have a topic, something you want to want to look up. And one of them, his topic was grow taller. <laughs> well, so we punched that in. Verses on growing taller. And all the verses that came up were about growing in your relationship with God. It wasn't about literally growing taller. But um, I got a verse on my phone, and you know how I... went on as if he hadn't said anything about it. But he knew it was going to happen. You can imagine how much it was on his mind, knowing that a week from now, I'm going to be dealing with all of these things. And yet, even with all of that going on inside him, Jesus took time to respond to these two blind men. They're sitting by the side of the road. They're, they're there where people come and go from the city so that they can beg and, and get a little money for something to eat. And um, in the Gospel of Mark, it tells us there was one man. His name was Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus isn't a proper name. The, the word bar means son. And so he was known as the son of Timaeus. Um, they didn't call him by his own name. They called him by his dad's name. And so even though he was a familiar sight, he wasn't really a personal friend to any of these people. But these, um, what's happening is there's, there's these two. There obviously were the two, but Bartimaeus was the one people took note of. Maybe he had been there a long time. Maybe he was louder. Maybe he was, uh, in some other way, stood out. But, uh, you know, it's like if, uh, if you saw me and uh, Bill Gates walking down the sidewalk together, you'd tell all your friends, hey, I saw Bill Gates, you know. <clears throat> um, in fact, it wouldn't have to be a Bill Gates. It could be anybody, you know. I get that. But anyway, they're, they're, they're sitting there, and they notice <clears throat> there's an awful lot more activity than normal. So they say, what's going on? And they find out. Jesus is passing by. And so with all the commotion, they add their voices, and they're trying to rise above the noise of everything else and be heard as they call on Jesus. Well, some of the people around them didn't want that much more noise, that kind of distraction, and they told them to be quiet. They didn't ask them nicely. They didn't say it politely. They scolded them. They yelled at them. They ordered them. They said, nobody cares what you want. Shut up. Jesus is busy. Be quiet. Just knock it off. And so, of course, they did, right? <clears throat> no, they didn't. They, they didn't quiet down. They doubled down. They didn't hush up. They cranked up the volume. They, they didn't quit. They pushed ahead. They knew this was their one chance to get the help they desperately needed and wanted. This is it. They hadn't been in the presence of Jesus before, but today they were. They had no idea <clears throat> that in a week Jesus would be dead. They just knew he was there now, he was in front of them now, and in a few minutes he wouldn't be. He'd be gone. The window of opportunity would be shut. This was the time they had to, to get his attention. And they had that compelling sense of urgency. This is it. This is it. All our lives, we've never had a chance like this. We may never have it again. Let's go for it. And the Bible wants us to have that sense of urgency in all our lives. It tells us in Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Turn to him. Turn to him now. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You may be hit by a bus. You may uh, bump your head and not be able to think as you have. Uh, you may, um, something else may happen. You may just lose the desire. There are people 
I've been with people at the end of their lives who had no desire to get right with God. I can't imagine any kind of poverty worse than that. They've lost their sense of need for God. And uh, it can happen with practice, with habit. But these two men knew this is the time. Their focus was entirely on Jesus. They knew that there were people around them who considered them a nuisance. Oh, there they are again with their feet sticking out in the road. There they are asking for money again. They knew there were those who didn't care a bit about them, just considered them in the way. But they didn't think about that. What they wanted to know is, what will Jesus do? What will Jesus say? What will Jesus want for us? Now, sometimes it's important not to care what people think. The Bible does tell us we should try to get along. If it is possible, God says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Whatever you can do to get along, whatever you can do to make things right, whatever you can do to have a healthy relationship, do it. Be respectful. But don't take it too far. Don't let anyone define who you are. That's God's job. Don't let anyone determine your value. God has already done that. Be the person he made you to be. It's his purpose for your life that matters. And don't be surprised if people don't get that. Don't be surprised if they say, oh, you're, you're going too far, you're getting too religious. You're spending too much time thinking about that and doing those things. Don't be surprised if some people don't understand when God gets hold of you and has a plan in your life and you want to live it. <clears throat> and while we're on the subject of don't be surprised, when you're in pain, don't be surprised that most people don't understand. Most people don't know what it's like to go through what you're going through. Why would they if they haven't been through it themselves? How would they know what it feels like? You know what? You didn't know what it felt like until it happened to you. And sometimes we set ourselves up for disappointment and even for bitterness by expecting that people should understand, that they should care enough to, to do something uh, that we need from them. But the Bible tells us nobody can really read your mind and nobody can really understand your heart. In fact, in Proverbs it says, your joy is your own. Your bitterness is your own. No one can share them with you. What he's saying is, <clears throat> you, uh, you're an individual, and you're unique, and nobody can know exactly how you feel. And he's not saying, too bad. He's saying, understand that that's how life is. Understand that that's what people are like. Let go of the expectation that people should understand that they should respond a certain way. If you have a friend who, who does understand, who tries to understand, who is there for you, that's a gift. That's a gift. Be grateful for it. Thank God for it. But don't think that it's normal. It, it's unusual. And think gratefully about it. The truth is, most people are fully focused on their own challenges. They have stuff going on in their own lives. Um, at church, at work, in your neighborhood, there's somebody focusing on the fact that they're, they're pretty sure they're going to lose their job and they're going to lose their medical coverage and they're not sure what's going to happen with that. They really need it. Or there's somebody who has a child who, who comes home and cries every night because she doesn't have any friends. None of the other kids are nice to her. And her mom is just trying to figure out what she can do. There's somebody who loaned money to a relative, a lot of money for them, and the relative promised, I, I can pay it back at a certain time, and now they're realizing they're not going to pay it back. They're not going to have it to pay back. I gave them that money, but it's gone. Now what am I going to do? 
I had, I had a plan for that money, but I don't have it anymore. There's somebody going through that. There's somebody who has a suspicious lump under their skin. They don't know if it's a big deal or if it's the, the real deal or what. There's somebody whose furnace is making awful noises and not producing much heat. And they're concerned because they don't know anything about furnaces and they don't have any extra money to buy a furnace and they don't know who they would call that they could trust. They would give them a good furnace at a good price. And you know, <clears throat> I don't do advertisements here, but I call Mike Botham. <laughs> he grew up in our church and he's a godly man. But you know what I'm saying. It might not be the furnace. It might be the roof. It might be the car. It might be three things. Or maybe the thing that's on somebody's mind is that their dog disappeared two days ago. They have no idea where it is. But everybody you look at, everybody around you has got things going on. And a lot of it is hidden and we can't really see it and we don't really know. But there's a lot of trouble in the world and it piles up sometimes and everybody gets a share and we're all trying to find our way through it. And so there's somebody sitting <clears throat> thinking I'm going through this awful time and nobody seems to care. Why are people reaching out to me? <clears throat> well, if you knew what was going on in the people around them, like in this building, all those other things are going on. And it's not on a name tag. It's not on the news. There's no way people know. Well, you know. <clears throat> and people are absorbed with the thing going on for them. If you've got a flat tire on the highway, that's what you're thinking about. You're not thinking about Ukraine or world hunger. <clears throat> you're trying to solve your problem. And, and, and the world operates that way. People operate that way. And I don't think most people are intentionally indifferent or hard-hearted. I think most people care. You know, if you, if you slip and fall down on the ice, there almost for sure two or three people will come over to make sure you're okay, help you up. Happened to someone in our church yesterday. Fell down and Three people came, got them back up. It, people are good that way. But sometimes other things are going on and, and they're occupied. And so all of that is just to say this. When, when something goes sour in your life, try not to be angry. Try not to be angry at people who just don't get it because they don't get it. I've, I, as a pastor, I've seen people leave the church. They were getting a divorce. They had a loved one die. There was some other crisis. Maybe they lost their business. And they felt like nobody cared. It wasn't true. A lot of times people didn't know, and sometimes they just didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to say. They hadn't been through it. They didn't know. And at the time when they need their church family the most, some people let go of it. That's what makes me sad. Because we do love you. We do want to be there for you. We are praying for you. And so don't give up. Don't, don't get an expectation that it should be a certain way. Let God meet your need, but let him uh, give, give some grace to those around you. Now, the truth is, on the other side, we can do better, can't we? We can be more alert. Let's ask God to make us more aware of folks around us. And let's ask God to help us keep that command, carry one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, the law of love. Let's be willing to see. Let's be willing to respond. Let's, let's pay attention. Let's have compassion. Let's be the people God can use any way he wants, any time he wants. I love it that people do that. We have somebody come by the office just about every week. He says, oh, I was at a garage sale. I found some things for the shoebox ministry, uh, for the kids' store, uh, for the food shelf. 
different things that they know we have that they can help. We have folks call and say, um, can I do something at the church? I got some free time. We have people who call about an individual. How's so-and-so doing? Do they need any help? Do they need a meal? It's a beautiful thing when God's people respond to God's call and care. Well, these two blind men were pretty much overlooked. I don't know. We know in some cases that it had been decades that people were crippled or blind or whatever before they met Jesus. I don't know how long it was for Bartimaeus and his friend, but people had gotten to the point where they were used to seeing him. And here's the thing. These guys couldn't see, but they realized the people around us have stopped seeing us. There was another kind of blindness going on. People had stopped seeing them, at least a lot of people. That's why they told them harshly, shut up. People had failed them, but they were hopeful that Jesus was different. And so they kept calling his name. They kept calling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. They persevered. They were desperate. They didn't have anywhere else to turn. They weren't going to give it up. They called on Jesus. They appealed to his authority. Son of David, you're the one descended according to God's plan. We saw the genealogy last Sunday. Jesus was a legitimate son of David, of Abraham. He was in line to be the Messiah. There were others who had been born in the same family, but he had the right credentials in terms of that as well as the other things. They knew he had the right to heal them. They knew he had the power to heal them. They only wondered if he would. And so they asked for mercy. They didn't make a demand. They didn't try to convince him they deserved it. They didn't promise, if you heal us, we'll do some things. They simply asked for mercy. They asked for compassion. They relied on his heart to want to help them. They relied on his power to cure them. He would care. He would cure. They, they counted on that, and it happened. It would have been great if the people in the crowd had taken up their call. They would have said, Lord Jesus, you've got to help Bartimaeus. He's been like this forever. Jesus, help them. If they'd have pulled them to their feet and, and brought them out into the road and brought them to Jesus, that happened. And maybe it was happening here. It doesn't say, but it'd be great if it did. It's a wonderful thing when we let God work through us. We're designed for it. We take a lot of pleasure in it, don't we? When you can help somebody, it makes you feel good in a, in a special way. There's nothing quite like it. When you can meet a need, and when you're just there at the right moment, the right time, what a great feeling it is. It's like, wow, thank you, God. You're thankful because you gave somebody 20 bucks. You're thankful because you helped somebody to their feet. You're thankful. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. You're made to be a giver. You're made to be an answer to prayer. And what a great thing when Jesus can do that. Let's ask Jesus and let's let him make us more like him so that we're watching for it, we're ready for it, we're prepared for it. Remember the story I told you about the gal that had a little extra money tucked away in her purse? She thought it was for herself, but God showed her it was for someone else. My guess is after that experience, she may have intentionally put money ready for somebody else. Because that's the kind of thing that's great to learn in life, isn't it? <clears throat> Jesus stopped. He physically stopped. Everybody had to stop with him. And he took time. He was ready. He called to them. <clears throat> and with everybody watching, he tenderly asked them, <clears throat> what do you want? What is it you want? He wasn't impatient. He was tender. What do you want me to do for you? Well, it's kind of obvious, wasn't it? No. He, nobody knows everything going on in someone's life. Blindness may not be the biggest thing right now, but it was for them. They said, Lord, we want to see. We want our sight. And Jesus, by just stopping, 
in speaking to them, showed them that their voices had been heard, that they, they mattered, that their need mattered, that God cared. And so when they answered that they wanted their sight, he knew what to do. You see, when you pray, it's good to be specific. I can say, oh, Lord, bless my friend. And God knows how to bless him. He, he has all the right ways to bless him. But how will I know if my prayer was answered? It's good to ask specifically, Lord, my friend is sick. Will you heal him? Lord, my friend is broke. Will you provide that need? Lord, my friend is discouraged. Would you help him to get through this? When you pray specifically, then you'll know that God answered. They prayed specifically. They prayed with hope. They prayed with faith in the character of the master. Their prayer didn't have to be loud and it didn't have to be long. Well, it started out loud because they wanted to make sure he heard, but God hears. You can whisper a prayer. You can think a prayer and it's loud enough for God and it doesn't have to be long before he knows it's real. It has to be real though. It has to be from your heart. It has to be genuine and it has to be humble. God is not a vending machine where you put in a prayer and you get an answer. God is a father and he needs to be treated with respect and with the, the care, that the reverence that he deserves. And so it needs to be humble. And this one was. And Jesus answered it with compassion in his heart and with power in his touch. Jesus reached out and physically touched these two people. I loved in this version that we watched Jesus laughing as he did it. Don't you think he did? Don't you think he found great delight in doing things like that for people? And when he answers your prayer, he's not, he's not like this saying, well, what do you want now? He's happy. He's happy to meet us where we are. He's happy that we call on him for what he can do. You and I know that he doesn't do everything on demand, but he does answer prayer. And can you imagine the moment he answered that prayer? The moment they could see? Now, neurologically, when someone who, who's blind uh, is, uh, has surgery and they can see, it takes a while for their brain to compute. It takes a while for them to be able to, to put it together, for the optic nerves and all that stuff to, to function smoothly like it normally does for us. But they could see instantly. They didn't have to go through that process. And you can imagine, all of a sudden, their eyes did what they were designed to do. They could see. They could do something they'd never done before. And they were filled with what? What word? Joy? Delight? I can see. And the question is, now what? What am I going to do now? I can see. I, I'm not going to be sitting here begging tomorrow. What am I going to do? Well, if you read the account, it tells us they followed him. They followed him. They wanted to do what he showed them next. You see, this passage shows us that we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He welcomes us into his family. He tells us that he has a plan. He offers to be our guide. And when he touches us, he does more than change our predicament. He changes us. He invites us into a way of life deeper than we've ever had before. An answer to prayer is never just about the answer to prayer. The answer to prayer is about deepening a connection with God. Building a relationship that's strong. Having a trust that gives stability to your life. Having a devotion that gives passion and purpose to your days. We don't have to earn his favor. We don't have to deserve his attention. We don't have to impress him with our family background or with our personal accomplishments. We don't have to clean up our lives first 
Well, as soon as I break this habit, I'm going to ask Jesus to help me. No, you need his help to break the habit. <clears throat> I, I saw something on Facebook. It said, <clears throat> do you really need Jesus to go to heaven? And the answer was, bro, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. <clears throat> You need them all the time. <clears throat> My brother was in, he lives in Colorado, was up in the mountains and, and drove home and they, there was some debris on the road. He, he went over it, you know, in traffic, you don't always see it. And, and um, he noticed a few minutes later his gas gauge was going down fast and he had punctured his gas tank. And uh, that's an that's a expensive deal these days. And uh, he got home and put a can under where it was leaking and he had a quart of fuel left, you know. He needed Jesus and he didn't even know it. He needed help and he got it. Now it can happen other ways, but he got into his own driveway uh, before he ran out of juice. And God has ways like that sometimes of just showing us, you know, I'm, I'm on top of things here, pal. I got this. I've got this. He loves it when we trust him. Now, he allows other kinds of experiences for other kinds of lessons, but he's good and he's strong. And so Jesus touched them because he had compassion in his heart. And he touched them because he had power in his touch. And they followed him. Here's what we need to know. We just need to know how desperately we need Jesus. Jesus. The psalmist asked, who do I have in heaven except you and give you peace? Amen. Let's go to that land. Come on, let's go to that land. It's a better, it's a better land, land I know With a bounding, bounding hearts will make us start We're trusting, we're trusting in our God oh, Come on, come on, come on, come on All aboard, all aboard Let's go to that let's land, go to that land. Come on, let's go to that land Where, where milk and honey flow Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's a better, it's a better land, land I know With a bounding, bounding hearts will make us start We're trusting, we're trusting 